You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production. Even in places with the most progressive drug policies, selling drugs remains illegal. And having police go after drug dealers is usually a key component of any strategy to address the overdose crisis. It's also a cornerstone of the war on drugs, a war North America has been waging for over 50 years. But what if we've been doing things all wrong? More than a million Canadians and Americans have died of an overdose in the last 20 years, and those numbers continue to skyrocket. Because fentanyl, the opioid driving most of the deaths, is highly potent, it's easier to smuggle, making police drug busts feel like a drop in the bucket. But are they actually worsening the epidemic? A study that was recently published in the American Journal of Public Health suggests so. The study looked at two years' worth of drug busts in Indianapolis and found that when police seize drugs, overdoses in the surrounding communities spike. While harm reduction activists have claimed this was true for a long time, this is the first empirical data making that link. What does or should this mean for drug policy going forward? My name is Manisha Krishnan. I'm a senior reporter at Vice News, and I'm sitting in Brooklyn under a subway line, so don't mind the noise. I'm filling in for Jordan Heath Rawlings. This is the big story. Grant Victor is an assistant professor at Rutgers University who researches harm reduction and drug policy. He co-authored the study. Hi, Grant. Hello. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. So why did you decide to study this? There have been a couple studies that came out uh, that kind of piqued our interest around a similar phenomenon where they were looking at drug seizure data, using it as kind of a surveillance tool to see what drugs were in you know, the drug market in a certain period of time. And some of those studies also looked at associations with, with overdose. The lead author on the study, Brad Ray, also had really strong relationships with a lot of folks in Indianapolis, including the Indianapolis Police Department. And through conversations with them, he had learned that um, overdose, following a drug seizure, they were handing out more naloxone than they typically would. So that got us kind of thinking about what exactly the mechanism might be and what would be the best way to actually measure that. And so within this project, we have a few different aims, but the primary one was to really look at this mechanism between drug seizures and subsequent overdoses in sort of time and space of where that drug seizure event occurred. And I think using our methodology and and what we found, it was one of the, the first studies to really substantiate this association within time and space of a drug seizure event. What were the most important findings? I think primarily the most important findings were that there there was a strong association between drug seizure and subsequent rise in overdoses following that event within time and space. Probably the most salient finding we had was that seven days following an opioid drug seizure event and within about 500 meters, so a two to five minute walk from where that drug seizure occurred, we saw overdoses, uh, fatal overdoses double in that time which is, you know, we we hypothesized that this might happen, but we weren't sure exactly of the magnitude. And obviously that's a a, a pretty concerning finding when you consider that on average, there were about three opioid drug seizure events a day in Indianapolis. And with stimulant-related seizures, there were more than that on average. I think they're around four, four to five. So we're not really talking about one isolated event a day. We're talking about several over the course of, of a couple of years. And knowing just where we are today with the overdose crisis and sort of the historic rates of death by, by overdose that we're seeing, it, it is really concerning. We also did see an association with stimulant-related drug seizure events. It wasn't as strong, and it was mostly related to non-fatal overdose events. But with, with, with a stimulant drug seizure, we saw about seven to eight and 100 meters from that event. Uh, non-fatal overdoses increase significantly. Okay, so just to recap, fatal overdoses doubled in the week following an opioid seizure within like a short walk of where that seizure took place. That's right. So why do you think that's happening? I think the main hypothesis here or, or theory of exactly why this is happening is that we know that a drug seizure at the very least results in drugs being displaced from 
a given area in a sort of localized drug market. So when you disrupt that opioid supply, there's disruptions to where folks can access drugs or more so what drugs they're actually able to get. And if you're a daily opioid user, you have a fairly short window of time to where you have diminishing tolerance, you're concerned about withdrawal, uh, you know, you might be scrambling a bit. You might be concerned about potential fallout, you know, if, if, if you were close to someone who was involved in the seizure or something like that. So there is a lot of acute stress on an individual following this event. And they also most likely need to seek out a new supply of drugs. So when you have sort of a diminishing tolerance, a fear of withdrawal, you may go to a new supply that has a, an uncertain dosage. And as a result, you see an, an increase in overdose risk. Even the drugs that they were accessing prior to any given seizure event are going to be highly viable. At, at sort of a baseline, the, the toxicity of drugs in, in the illicit market right now are, are, are really, really toxic. And so this really just confounds those risks. In a magnitude, we couldn't quite measure, but we do see that it does result in poor outcomes related to overdose. Are there other instances where you see this happening? Like, for example, if somebody is sent to jail or if they're evicted or maybe even when they go to rehab? Absolutely. Yeah. We've published, again, out of Indianapolis a couple of years ago, we had a paper come out that looked, a lot, looked at folks who uh, were leaving jail. And what we found was we looked at one sample of folks who were released from jail in 2017, and we followed them for three years afterward. And each subsequent year f following their arrest, this one cohort accounted for about 20% of all overdose deaths in Marion County, which is the county in Indianapolis. Just that one cohort. Wow. About a fifth of all county overdose deaths. And we found that those who were arrested on a syringe-related charge had an even higher risk of death following the release. That gets to your question, I think, about um, the mechanism of, of diminishing tolerance and not having adequate sort of harm reduction and treatment supports upon leaving um, something like, you know, a jail, which in Marion County and in most places have relatively few resources for those with opioid use disorder. So you do see a diminished tolerance. You go back into a drug market that you don't know that well. It's fairly unpredictable. And, and the risk is really high in that first two weeks or so following release. The same is true for folks who are admitted to an emergency department following a non-fatal overdose. The risk goes up again if tolerance is sort of curtailed during that, that stay in the hospital, and if there, again, aren't adequate supports leaving a, a treatment center or an emergency department. We see similar things as well um, at a broader sort of community scale. When you talk about, and this has been happening for probably the last 20 years or so, where there were policy measures in place at the beginning of the overdose crisis when there was a lot of concern about prescription opioids. So there was a wave of policy measures that really made it more difficult to access prescription opioids. Pain patients were kind of put out. What it did is it shifted an entire market of folks who were dependent on prescription opioids, some of those with a legitimate you know, prescription and, and, and medical concerns, to substances that are more risky. A prescription opioid is less risky than heroin that is criminalized. Criminalized fentanyl happens to be more risky than criminalized heroin. And we're seeing another phase with, with stimulants and um, with other sort of novel substances popping up like xylazine that we're still working through. But the, the trend is pretty clear. And, and these things have been happening for, you know, 40, 50 years where the so-called iron law of prohibition, where, where you try to tamp down on something and it, it really doesn't go away. It kind of shifts and in terms of drugs, most likely becomes more lethal. And so we do see this in other areas. And it, it's really about how you want to measure the way in which drug markets are, are disrupted. Can we talk a little bit more about tolerance? Because that is something that comes up a lot in the context of overdoses. What happens physically? Like how quickly does someone's tolerance go down? And what happens if they try to start using again, kind of at the same level that they were before their tolerance dropped? Yeah, tolerance can dissipate fairly quickly, especially relative to, to opioids. And we see this effect, say, in terms of um, a jail stay for one to two days, the tolerance can, can diminish significantly. And that may occur prior to you feel withdrawal effects where you're physically sick. 
And so the tolerance may may decrease. An individual who uses regularly knows their body quite well, most likely. And and they they may have a gauge on this, but th- but they may not. In any case, when you go through a short period of abstinence and return to use, it is really really dangerous. Given that none of the drugs you buy have a you know a nutrition label or any kind of information on them of what exactly you're getting, it's highly unpredictable and it's really toxic. And so if your tolerance is is titrated at any level, it's it's, it's going to increase your risk. And we see this bear out in, in our study and in many others as well. Harm reduction policies are really polarizing right now. There's crackdowns in San Francisco on public drug use. Um, in Alberta, they're considering involuntary rehab. So what are some of the takeaways that policymakers could take from your research? I think our research provide an opportunity for policymakers to embrace science in a, in a meaningful way. And I, I hope that they at least engage in a conversation over our findings and those in other studies. It does seem, it is worrisome though, that we seem to be kind of falling back into old habits. Not that we ever really discarded the war on drugs or an approach to zero, zero tolerance, tough on crime, that all of those sort of tropes that are used in terms of drug policy. But you know, we're seeing a wave in New Jersey, for example, they just passed a bill to increase uh, penalties for fentanyl possession. And these are really taking hold in, in a lot of different states here in, in the U.S. Harm reduction, as always, has been, like you said, a hot topic and controversial. So there's a lot of work to do in just around messaging and, and what exactly we're, we're saying here. You know, we're, we don't want to diminish public safety, but we need to look critically at some of these you know, sort of old habits that we've been doing for a long, long time that we're finding maybe are killing lots of people in a situation where these deaths are are preventable. You know, the Biden administration has been, at least relative to other presidential administrations, they have been a proponent of harm reduction. But, you know, there's kind of this, I don't know, it feels like a sleight of hand when you see, you know, the federal budget, I think for 2023, increased funding for interdiction and law enforcement to stop the flow of fentanyl, to stop the flow of all these drugs. And it, it, it's really kind of disheartening. And, and I think we have enough evidence now over 50 or 60 years to say, maybe let's try something different. You know, with this study too, one thing that really drew me to the question was just uh, the scene of a press release following a drug seizure. These are canon in drug policy. I mean, they are sort of the public facing messaging for law enforcement, and for any of those invested in in um, stemming the supply of drugs. These are seen as a, a success story. And, you know, they have sort of picnic table laid out and various items on it that were seized. And, and what if those events were actually really harmful? And how do we get that message to, to lay people and, and to policymakers? Because I think the general public, even really bright people who I've talked to about this study that don't work in drug policy, we're surprised to learn that those actions may be antithetical to public health. So the, I think the common understanding still is that they at least are doing some good in removing drugs or firearms or paraphernalia off the streets, but they're probably not really removing much of anything. It's just a sort of replacement and recycling of, of, of what, was, what was taken. So if seizures aren't an effective tool in the fight against addiction and overdose, where should our resources be going? What would be the first place that you would allocate funds? Oh, well, that's a good question. I think right before I allocate funds, I I, I really think there's such a downstream effect with a lot of these drug seizure events. Is there a fall? Is there an increase in crime, for example, after these drug market disruptions? Where are these events occurring and are they their effects more uh, disproportionately felt in various communities? I would venture to guess, although we haven't studied it, you know, you could probably look at something based on just socioeconomic status of any given community. Are these effects felt differently? Are seizures concentrated in different areas? And what are the implications there? So I think big picture for me and some of the co-authors may disagree, but if we could simply cease the act of of drug seizures, at least in an experimental way for a year or two. I think that would be really interesting. And I think to do that, you have to have strong relationships with 
with law enforcement and, and other agencies who are working in that space, but it might be worth investigating. And, and if the findings are promising, then I think we have a better idea of really where we can start allocating other funds. Short of that, you know, there are other options with um, officer discretion and trainings, and, and these might help with the findings we have here in terms of when they do encounter someone who might be facing a misdemeanor or nonviolent drug offense. Can discretion be used there to where the drugs aren't taken from them, where they're not arrested and incarcerated? So that's another option. And then there are, I think, probably the most viable and where the evidence shows most strongly is 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 bolstering harm reduction efforts, especially in a state like like Indiana, who have some of the most competent and passionate folks working in harm reduction that I've I've ever met. And they're doing so and have been doing so with really dancing around various legal uh, and financial barriers. They're hamstrung by by a num- number of other factors, basically operating a health organization underground for decades. And so supporting those folks is really important. Um, flooding areas with naloxone, it would be great too if they, we could open overdose prevention centers and things like that, which Canada has a lot more success with than, than we have in, in the U.S. by far. So there's a lot of room to improve in those areas. Another idea that we've had from this study is is kind of looking at how we could use a sort of surveillance notification system following a drug seizure. The best idea so far that we've kind of been working through is if police can alert harm reduction or other community organizations in the immediate aftermath of a drug seizure event, where it occurred, what they took, et cetera, and flooding that area with, with resources like naloxone, substance use treatment, et cetera. There are issues there, and 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 it's and it's always difficult to to compromise when you have various groups working together in sort of opposite directions. It seems one of which is that I think just from our discussions, police are are hesitant to say before a seizure event happens because it might derail an investigation or something. So you still have a time lag there, and 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 if you're coming in in the immediate aftermath of a drug seizure event. I think you risk losing some trust or you, you, you at least have to manage how trustworthy whoever is coming into that community right afterward, how are the community members going to respond to that person? Is it, are they going to think it's, you know, a trap? <laughs> are they going to think it's, you know, plainclothes officers or, or, or what? And if you remove the, the factor of trust, then what exactly do you do and, and, and how how many resources do you flood into these areas? Because it seems to me you're constantly chasing these different, you know, interdiction efforts. So I, I think for me, it's it's really important to get the message out that, that these are potentially harmful. Do you think that there is a police department out there that would agree to stop seizing drugs, even in an experimental way? Like, does there seem to be that type of appetite or open-mindedness? Because it's such a, it's such a departure from the norm. Yeah, it is. I, I do think there's there's some out there, certainly. I haven't met them or, or really broached this idea in, in a serious way, but it is something that I intend to continue to pursue. There are, in New Jersey, they've done some really creative things in Camden and Trenton, and I think also in Newark, they've, they've had some some really interesting policing models that have shown uh, a lot of promise. And so, you know, maybe if they've approached this issue in other ways, say like crisis response for a mental health issue, which I think has gone a long way in how it's criminalized and approached by law enforcement and the, the greater public opinion that this is a, a medical condition and, and, and we, need to, we need to do something different other than criminalize it. I think we can frame drug seizures perhaps in the same manner um, it's really reversing a lot of stigma. I think also framing it in a way that is protective of of folks who are responding to it uh, in a sort of a sense of like their occupational safety and things like that, where you, you can kind of frame it in a way to say that this is m- maybe mutually beneficial for for both law enforcement and for for public health. You know, if 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 we were to say if if you take some time away from the drug seizure bit. And it it frees up a lot of time to pursue violent criminals, uh, investigate homicides, ensure homeland security. All of those things could be better focused in other areas. Maybe that message holds weight 
but that's purely speculation. But nonetheless, I think it's worth pursuing. So we'll see. I was going to ask, how significant is this research? Because a lot of people in harm reduction have been saying this for a long time, that the war on drugs is making this crisis worse. But just from an evidence perspective, how would you contextualize your findings? In all humility, I think it's it's huge. You're right. A lot of folks who, who use drugs or who have been working in the harm reduction space, these are really um, common sense um, and probably maybe a, you know looks like a waste of time to some of them because they, they've kind of felt this, known this, witnessed it for a, a really long time. But the importance of doing a study like this and publishing it in a public health journal, especially the American Journal of Public Health, can kind of use their voice um, in a way that's backed by evidence and, and move this discussion into different spheres. You know, we can we can move this into sort of an academic sphere, which is important, but it, it's probably more so important to, again, move this into the lexicon of those who are in law enforcement, who are policymakers, to show, you know, they've been, these harm reductionists have been on this for a long time. Um, we're able to substantiate a lot of what they've said. And now how do we support them and how do we help them support those that they've been working with for however long? So I think from that sense, it it is a really important paper. It touches on, you know, the content area is highly salient to our national well-being. Drug overdose deaths along with, with suicide are dragging down our national life expectancy, which I don't know, it feels pretty important to me to to see what's causing us to live shorter lives across the board. It's something that that really kind of affects everyone. And so from a public health standpoint, I think it's it's one of the top issues we're dealing with right now, among others. And from a public safety standpoint, public safety is an area of service that's been scrutinized quite a bit in the last few years. And I think our intention was not really to scrutinize law enforcement from the jump or or really at all. It's it's more so that that this is an element that's been going on for a really long time. As I said earlier, uh, it gets a lot of press and praise. And so we kind of wanted to shine a light on the potential adverse effects of something like this and and see about, I don't know, bringing in some kind of of change and and trying to address these problems in in a different way. What's next? What other studies are in the works? We have loads of qualitative data from this study. We've done interviews with law enforcement, public health officials, and people who use drugs in both Indianapolis and Detroit. So we're looking at moving some of those papers forward in the near future, which in academic speak is probably like two years. Um, We also are conducting an analysis of how drug seizure events are reported within the media. And so we're scraping media articles over the last decade that report on drug seizure events. Most of these are local events. Most of them, or at least some, are press releases that are released through law enforcement. And then we get a press release from a local syndicate in in that sense. And so we're really just trying to create a database of drug seizure events through lay media because there aren't really a a national database that catalogs these events. So um, that's, that's kind of the next step in terms of just this project. But we're also looking at replicating this study in other places, other cities. So it's interesting to us to look at, one, is this effect observed in areas that may be more or less conservative in their approach to to drug policy and policing? And uh, are these effects held in areas that maybe have a slightly different demographic makeup than, than a city like Indianapolis? And with that, also looking at other factors that might moderate the increase in overdose uh, following a, a drug seizure event. So was paraphernalia collected? Was firearms? Did this result in overdose plus violence? And another interesting question that we've been kind of wrestling with, something that's come from us through our interviews with people who use drugs, is looking at these drug seizure events as a possible mechanism for displacement and gentrification. So those are a few ideas that we've been kind of tossing around. But generally speaking, we would like to replicate this in other studies. Super interesting. Grant, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. This was a lot of fun. Grant Victor is an assistant professor at Rutgers University. That was The Big Story. For more, head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. If you felt a certain way about this episode, let us know. The Big Story always loves to hear listener feedback. 
reach us on Twitter at the Big Story FPN. Email hello at the Big Story or leave a voicemail by calling 416 935 5935. The Big Story is available wherever you get your podcasts, and you can get it on a smart speaker by asking it to play the Big Story podcast. Thanks for listening. I'm Anisha Krishnan, in for Jordan. He'll be back next week.